uh, being here and thanks for organization to invite me for this uh, talk. Um, yes, I will uh, talk about uh, controllable AI, a term uh, that is uh, heard more often in the AI community. Um, so, um, the recent development in AI um, made uh, some people very enthusiastic about uh, what can be done to automate all kinds of tasks, but also uh, some people to fear uh, uh, what's, uh, the th about the things that can go wrong. And uh, one of the characteristics of AI systems is actually its autonomy. The fact that they make uh, decisions on behalf of human decision maker. And uh, these decisions uh, might be uh, violating uh, uh, human norms, human values, uh, might result in unexplainable behavior, and all those kind of things. So the idea is that um, uh, these autonomous systems, in general architecture of those kind of uh, systems, is that you have an AI system we call the agents or autonomous agents or intelligent agents. They are embedded in an environment. They uh, do sense the environment. Uh, they have some internal representation of environment and make a decision based on the objective, uh, based on objectives they are designed, uh, 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 this autonomous system are designed. And then they have some actuators that uh, basically change the state of environment. And this process of uh, sense, reasoning, and act is a continuous uh, kind of cycle that autonomous agents uh, do. Examples are, uh, of course, autonomous cars, and, uh, uh, but also algos, uh, which basically operate in financial markets, uh, buy and sell stock uh, shares. And uh, more recently, uh, ChatGPT. Um, and uh, you might imagine that all of them uh, might uh, uh, result in, uh, in a dangerous uh, behavior. The more autonomy these kind of systems get, the less autonomy the human um, uh, get. Uh, so suppose that you cannot decide how you drive from uh, one point to another point. Uh, the point that all goes, for example, are sometimes uh, automatically decide to sell or buy and are causing a kind of cascading effect in a financial market, uh, resulting in the kind of flips in, uh, in the value of the market and uh, ChatGPT, which you're all aware of, uh, might have a, a kind of offensive, sometimes uh, racial uh, statements and uh, that we do not like, uh, like them to have. So the question is um, um, how we can uh, basically manage this kind of uh, undesirable uh, aspects of uh, AI systems. Um, uh, there are some issues uh, that uh, come up in the AI community uh, which basically point at uh, the concern that we have about this AI system, autonomous systems. One of those is, uh, as I said, a value alignment. What we would like to have is that the decisions of uh, autonomous system should be aligned with our norms and values. Things like, for example, fairness, uh, privacy, and uh, explainability. So if they make a decision, then uh, we should, uh, we like that those decisions are fair. Right? So if you go to a banking system and there is a, a recommended system that the bank is using and says, okay, uh, this is the maximum mortgage that you can uh, give to this uh, specific person, then you would like that this decision is not an aggregated decision and uh, very much uh, decide based on the future of the applicant at that moment. Same things with explainability. If you go to a healthcare systems and uh, and the AI system make a diagnosis, then you would like that the diagnosis is, uh, of course, correct, but also the way it's explained to the patient uh, should be really different than if uh, those decisions are explained to a colleague uh, in a healthcare system, or if you want to explain uh, the diagnosis to the family of the patient. So this notion of explainability, how exactly the decision have been made and how it can be or it should be explained to, uh, to different stakeholders uh, should be uh, 
should be carefully considered. Um, another issue is the safety, safety critical systems. Uh, so you know that these days a lot of machine learning uh, systems are trained to perform a certain task with certain kind of uh, performance uh, measures. And in the safety critical systems like in nuclear plants or for example healthcare system, you cannot uh, jeopardize a uh, uh, situation by uh, just saying buying this inaccuracy or imperfection of the learned system. So uh, this safety issue become very important and, um, and the decisions uh, that the system should make should be safe uh, with, of course, respect to some kind of safety requirements. And finally, um, the notion of responsibility. Uh, we know uh, these terms, uh, buzzword, responsible AI. This is not about responsible AI. It's about uh, liability. Uh, if uh, systems uh, make a wrong decision, it's often in a collaboration with other systems, interaction with other systems, so how can you pinpoint which system or part of the system has been responsible for the bad outcome, uh, for undesirable outcome? So the question is about how uh, you can identify, trace the decision making of a system in, a, in an interactive context and uh, pinpoint the responsible elements of the AI systems. So uh, these are some concerns about um, uh, recent uh, development in AI, specifically AI systems that have a high level of autonomy. So um, what I um, will like to share with you in this uh, talk is uh, a number of um, research directions that I'm employing and I would like to share with you. Um, so uh, these are all uh, directed uh, to control AI systems. So one of the uh, directions of research that I'm doing is how we can use basically uh, what we call norms, requirements, uh, to guide the behavior of autonomous system in a way that, uh, uh, that the behavior becomes safe and aligned with uh, values and norms that we have. Another direction is, uh, of course, the um, uh, idea of uh, safety. Uh, so many of these agent systems or autonomous systems are either designed by rule-based systems or uh, symbolic systems, but some of them are based on the machine learning techniques. And uh, what you would like to do is that when they are trained, that um, especially, specifically in a, in a physical or real environment, you don't want that those systems explore unsafe actions just to learn, right? And, um, and definitely also when you deploy those systems, uh, you would like to monitor uh, their systems such that they do not uh, perform unsafe actions during execution. So this is particular um, type of research that we do in a reinforcement learning, deep reinforcement learning. And finally, I would like uh, to share also some of uh, my projects on uh, traceability of AI system and specifically how we can trace uh, the decision making, not only of one system, but of a set of AI system that uh, collaborate with each other or that uh, interact with each other in a shared environment. Think of uh, autonomous cars in a highway or things of all those uh, that are operating uh, in a financial market. So um, let's focus on the first um, research direction, how we can use norms uh, basically to direct and guide the behavior of autonomous systems. So this idea is uh, pretty much um, uh, from uh, social sciences, uh, uh, from our society, uh, consisting of all these autonomous agents and in order to uh, safeguard certain system level property, uh, we have introduced norms and values, right? Either legal norms or a social norms or, or a moral norms. These are basically a kind of mechanism in our society that uh, guide, coordinate, and control our, our behaviors. And there are uh, many mechanisms that enforce these norms. Like, for example, if you have a legal norms that's as uh, prescribed that, for example, in a traffic, certain speeds should be 
um, uh, should be uh, uh, should be respected. So you, you cannot, uh, for example, go above 120 on a, a highway. Then there are enforcement mechanisms like, for example, these cameras or police officers who monitor the behavior of cars and uh, they might intervene when violation of those norms take place. Right. So there, there are norms in our society. There are uh, kind of enforcement mechanism that uh, try to uh, uh, make the behavior of individuals uh, comply with those norms. So how this exactly work for AI system? I would like to start with um, what we as a computer scientist, AI um, researchers, uh, look at the systems. So a system like, for example, a car um, has a certain behavior. So in a computer science, we would like to find out what are all possible behaviors that the systems can make. You start usually with kind of a specification or partial specification of the systems and you say, okay, now these are uh, the possible state of the system and these are the possible actions and then you can generate all possible behaviors of the systems. Like for example, this uh, carrot here, um, it is on a position zero in a very simplified uh, example, of course. And uh, there are two agents, agent number one and two, and they can push or wait. If they can push and the other one uh, waits, then of course uh, the, the, the car moves to the next position. And if they both push or both wait, the car doesn't move. So in order to basically analyze all possible behaviors of, um, of uh, this kind of uh, scenarios, we use uh, what's called in the mathematics concurrent game structure basically which consists of a state of a system, system, a multi-agent system, and uh, like for example Q0, Q1, and Q2, and then the transition are about concurrent actions, right? So what each agent, what each uh, system might do in each state. Like for example, in each state here, you can see that agent one and two might decide either to, um, um, you don't see my mouse, and so uh, you can see, for example, that in the starting position, uh, position zero, uh, both agents can either wait or both can push, in which case um, the system stays in a, in a position one. Or if, for example, agent one push and agent two wait, then um, uh, the, the car goes from position zero to position one. And these are all possible behaviors that you might have, right? So just a correction. We are not about here machine learning or data-oriented uh, uh, approaches. We just talk about safety-critical systems. We would like to examine all possible behaviors and to find out whether, given these all possible behaviors, certain properties hold. Okay? Now, in order to find out whether certain... Uh, so what we basically like to do is... Um, uh, having this set of all possible behaviors introduce norms right, that if they are complied with, that a certain system value will, uh, will be guaranteed. Right? So like for example, uh, we would like uh, to say that um, uh, if uh, it is prohibited that the agent one wait in a position, uh, uh, position one. Okay? So that's a kind of very simple norm. Right? That is a very simplified idea of a norm that I want to share with you just to understand the mechanism behind this. Right? So this norm says for agent one is a prohibition that um, uh, take a weight action in position one. Now, if you impose this norm in this uh, uh, scenario, then the question is what kind of property can you guarantee? What can you be... Uh, uh, how can be uh, which kind of property can be uh, can, can you prove that are guaranteed if you impose and enforce these norms okay so for example if you say okay in position one right agent one is prohibited to wait what does it mean that agent two can either uh, push or wait and agent two has uh, basically the power to stay in a position one or not, right? So it is the responsibility of agent two to stay in a position one forever. Agent one cannot have this responsibility, cannot be blamed of uh, not staying in position one. 
So this is a very exactly, again, a simple example to show you what, uh, what we mean by this notion of norms and norm uh, enforcement. Another norm, so norms can be very complicated. So another norms that we, for example, might have is uh, the second one, uh, which says if uh, you start in a position zero, then uh, you are prohibited to go uh, to be at the position two before you meet position one. Right? So in other words, these are formal, of course, requirements, formal norms. And in uh, natural language, you would say, if you start uh, uh, in this uh, scenario, you basically have to reach position two via position one. Right? So you cannot directly go to position two. Right? So if you, for example, have to do an exam, you first have to register before uh, doing the exam. Right? This kind of um, uh, norms it can also be enforced in these kind of systems, basically enforcing uh, the system that visits uh, position first, position one, before going to position two. So there are a um, huge number of um, uh, type of norms that we can introduce, norms, conditional norms with a deadline, uh, norms with, uh, about which actions are uh, obliged or prohibited in a certain state, and, uh, and of these kinds. Right. The expressivity of these norms uh, depends on the language that you can have, the logical language that you can have to basically express those kind of property. Right. The more expressive, of course, it becomes, the more complicated and complex, uh, computational complexity you get for uh, enforcing those norms. So the idea, again, is we have a system, a safety critical system. We would like to analyze all possible behaviors and then we would like to know what happens, which kind of properties can be guarantee of the system if we impose norms. Right? Um, so norms uh, can be enforced by two different means, either uh, by regimenting the norms, basically ensuring that bad behavior does not happen, does not occur. It's like you, know, you, uh, you have a norm to pay for transportation, if you want to use the transportation system, and then you regiment it basically by putting these doors uh, in the front of a metro system, right? That doesn't allow you to get in if you don't have any valid, uh, 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 valid payments. Okay, so basically you regiment um, the norm of having payment for transportation system by putting these doors. You prevent any violating behavior. That is what we call norm regimentation. But you can also um, enforce norms by means of sanctions. So basically you say you are not allowed to do certain action, but if you do, you have to pay. So a, a prime example in Amsterdam is the law that says you are prohibited to sell the drugs, but if you do it, you have to pay the taxes. Okay? So these kind of things make the autonomous systems more free and flexible to operate. Right? So you don't basically limit the autonomy of uh, systems, but you allow, basically, you try to incentivize them to show a certain behavior. So let me explain um, this norm regimentation in the system that I just explained. So again, on the... Uh, Left side, um, there is this uh, uh, system, transition system or concurrent game structure that explain all possible behaviors. And then we have a norm. Again, I use this very simple norm to, to illustrate how it works. It says uh, you are prohibited to be in position uh, one, uh, uh, so you are prohibited uh, to do uh, weight action if you are in a position one. Now, what happens if you enforce this by means of regimentation? You want to prohibit, right? You want to ensure that uh, there is no weight action in a position one. Uh, and that's actually for agent one. So what you, what you do basically is you remove any transition, any movement uh, of agent one in a position one. So agent one cannot go back by doing push, uh, by, by doing weight, sorry, from Q1. And it can also not doing weight. So depending on the second agent, then it can uh, stay forever in position one, or it can go back to position zero. Right? Then it's the decision of the second agent. So the agent one here cannot, um, in the right side, agent one 
has no action weight in position one. So there's a kind of regimenting the norm of weighting in position one. And for sanctioning or, or for um, uh, yeah, enforcing a norm by means of sanction, it means that you have this um, basic transition system and you have to update this um, transition system with the sanction. Basically, you say which type of behavior is prohibited but you don't want to exclude or remove the transition, you say, okay, you might be, you might be allowed to use this uh, transition, but in the resulting state, you have to do some payment. Okay? These are very pretty uh, standard mechanisms in uh, economics, uh, in a branch of economics called mechanism design. Right? So what you do in a mechanism design in economic system is changing the environment basically to incentivize individuals to do certain behavior. Okay? So here uh, the question is how can you incentivize by means of sanctioning uh, that individual agents behave differently? Obviously we need some information about uh, the design objective of the system. Right? So for example suppose in a kind of future uh, scenario that the cars use highway and you would like, for example, to say you are prohibited to uh, have a speed above 100, otherwise you have to pay a certain amount, right? But this exactly the certain amount of money or punishment or sanction uh, make some individual agent to comply and others to violate, right? And that means that you should know something about the preferences or about uh, uh, the budget of each car, basically, to guarantee this. Right? So you need more information. Okay? So just to give you another example is this um, daycare uh, facility, um, example from uh, many years ago in Israel. Um, they noticed that the parents come and take the kids a little bit later than uh, 5 uh, o'clock in the afternoon. And the daycare, in order to incentivize par parents to come on time, says, okay, if you come late for every hour, you pay certain amount of money. And actually, the amount of money was not properly designed such that parents saw that as a kind of permission to leave their kids there for a longer time and a pay. Right? So what I try to say is that the whole notion of prohibition and norms can become very close uh, to the notion of taxing and taxation. Right? So the, the morality aspects can be removed from this normative aspects and become a kind of taxation system, right? a kind of economic view on uh, uh, systems. So what in general we can do with this kind of norm system is as follows. Right? So theoretically, in a computer science uh, terms, uh, we have a transition system which consists of a state and transitions, exactly the same transition system as I showed you, concurrent game structure. And you have a property that you would like to guarantee, a property phi. Something like, for example, bad things never happens, right? Uh, the system cannot stay forever in a certain state, okay? This kind of thing. And then a finite set of norms, right? And then the question is, if you enforce these norms, in the model, right, can you guarantee that the property phi holds? Right? So we know that the property phi in a transition system does not hold. You cannot guarantee the system cannot stay in a certain position forever. You cannot guarantee that. And if you impose some norms, can you guarantee that? Can you see that this? This is basically the idea that governments usually have. It says, okay, we would like to have a certain, um, for example, CO2 emission level at the highway which norms should we impose to guarantee that, uh, that that level of emission, allowed level of emission, can be guaranteed. And that is kind of designing of norms automatically. And um, we showed that this problem is actually very hard. Uh, it's a, a PS-based uh, PS hard. And so it means that computationally it's very hard to design such a norm. But note that if you design such a norm for a given system at hand once, right, then you can use it indefinitely. Right? So you need basically to do some investment in a computation to design the proper norm, and then you can use it uh, for the future cases. Um, 
Some issues, a challenging issue in this respect is, uh, for example, that you start with a kind of environment where you can have a limited monitoring uh, possibility. So, for example, take um, an example of a highway. You cannot monitor all kind of different speeds, but uh, whether the, a car has a certain speed, uh, below a certain speed or above it. Right? So that's a kind of threshold uh, sensor. So uh, if you have a norm uh, which basically needs a, a, a different type of uh, monitor to be more precise, to be more accurate, then, um, and you don't have such a monitor, and then the idea is to revise the norm such that this imperfect monitor acts as a kind of perfect one. Right? So I come back to this. A another one is when the system objective right, it changes. Note again, you impose norms to guarantee system level properties. Okay? Now, what if the system level property changes? Right? Then the norm might not be an optimal norm anymore. So then you have to revise this norm. I give example of both of them. So think about a kind of traffic situation again. So it's a kind of ring road uh, system. And the cars can uh, come into the ring road, P1, and then it can stay in the ring road. These are the states in the middle, state S2 to S4, and then it can exit the uh, ring road. Okay? And the cars can have several speeds, a speed like, for example, uh, 60, 70, and 80 kilometers an hour. Okay? And suppose the norm is that you... Uh, uh, that the maximum speed can be at uh, 60 km an hour. But the monitor can detect only speed above 75. That's a kind of imperfect monitor. Right? So the monitor is not sensitive to all kinds of speeds. It can only decide whether the speed is above 75 or not. So it basically, it means that the monitor cannot distinguish any behavior between 60 and 70. Right? They are, for the monitor, one and the same type of behavior. But the norm says you should not exceed 60. So obviously, the monitor cannot detect all the violation. So there are a lot of false negatives that will be not detected. So then the question is, that doesn't make sense, actually, to issue a norm when you don't have a proper monitor to check the, uh, the, the bad behavior. Right? So then the question is, okay, can you then tell me if I have this kind of sensor systems or a monitoring system with this specification, can you tell me how I should revise the norm minimally such that this imperfect monitor becomes perfect so that all violation can be detected, right? So a minimal change of the existing norm such that the monitor, the imperfect monitor, becomes a perfect one. Yeah? So basically the idea is don't generate norms that you cannot enforce. Okay? And if you have a norm, just think about you have an enforcement capacity. How could you change the norm such that your enforcement capacity really properly work? So the problem here, again, to revise this norm is uh, exponential time in a computational complexity sense. So it means also that once uh, you have this imperfect monitor and the behaviors of the system, you need to do some computation before uh, you uh, revise the norms. Another one, which has happened recently in the Netherlands, is about when the system level uh, property that you would like to ensure by means of norms changes. Like, for example, recently the court in the Netherlands has ordered the Prime Minister Rutte, to um, basically reduce the CO2 level pollution to a certain level. Right? And so that uh, Rutte decided, so our minister president decided basically to change the traffic norms right, to guarantee the new system objective. Right? So the government has to reduce the CO2 and then the question is which kind of measure the government can take to ensure this system level property. Right? And one of these measures was reducing the speed on the highways. So basically the idea uh, that we propose in, um, in, in our uh, research uh, work is, um, so suppose that you have a data, uh, the traffic data uh, from uh, cars, so you can monitor each car uh, when they uh, enter a 
a highway when they exit, and then you can see which speed they uh, did and how much CO2 they have uh, generated, right, by kind of estimate. And, um, and then you have a norm, um, and then you basically think, okay, now this system level norm, uh, this system level objective is uh, guaranteed by these norms. And then the system level changes, so instead of, for example, certain amount of CO2 pollution, we have to reduce that, so the system level property changes, and the question is, what happens if you change this system level norm? Obviously, many behavior become, um, uh, become false positive and false negative, in the sense that some uh, behaviors, these are the behavior of cars, uh, are compliant right, with, uh, with the old norm, right, but they are not satisfying the system objective. They just uh, too polluted. Right? Uh, they do not satisfy the system level property of reducing the CO2. And others, they are now violating uh, the norm, right? and uh, they basically which do satisfy uh, the system objective. So what you would like to have, having this data, right? and which is disturbed, which has been, um, uh, uh, for which you have now false positive and false negative, you would like to change the norm in a way that these false negatives and false positives are removed. Right? So basically, you have a system level property, new one, and then you have to revise the norm such that the false negatives and false positives are removed. And this is a kind of problem that uh, we considered. Um, and uh, if you want to solve this problem, again, um, uh, algorithmically, uh, then the problem uh, we show it's an MP hard problem. But uh, what this kind of computational uh, complexity means, basically, they call for a heuristic algorithm, right? That um, can be used, basically, to approximately uh, or to uh, remove uh, as much this false and uh, false positive and false negative as much as possible. So this, uh, this heuristic uh, way that we uh, basically introduce it consists of two phases, synthesizing of new norms right? and, uh, and, and basically testing whether those norms are satisfying the, the criteria, the system level objective. And uh, we do this by <coughs> synthesizing um, more strong norms, more weak norms, or just uh, doing arbitrary changes in the norm. And then we see that our heuristic algorithm basically explores the space of possible norm revision uh, results in uh, improved uh, behavior. So uh, this y-axis here is the accuracy of the norm in terms of how many false negatives, false positives can be removed. And um, on the x-axis are the strategy of revising, <coughs> sorry, revising the norms. So um, I explained you uh, that norms can be used to guide uh, uh, the behavior of individuals to secure some system level property, especially for safety critical systems. And um, I explained some challenges, like for example, with um, imperfect monitors, but also when the system uh, level um, uh, properties um, or objectives changes. Now let's go to another topic that I wanted to uh, uh, present. It's about a safe and efficient AI, in particular, safe and efficient reinforcement learning. Right. So for many autonomous systems, because they are uh, continuously making decisions in the environment, so it's a kind of sequential decision-making system, uh, reinforcement learning has been uh, shown to be very effective mean to learn those kind of behavior. So reinforcement learning basically uses data uh, and uh, try to find a policy that uh, uh, guide agents to decide which action to take in which uh, state. Now, they use also neural networks, which is called uh, deep reinforcement learning, to basically approximate this um, Q function or um, uh, to generate this policy. So, uh, what we again know is that um, many of these reinforcement learning uh, machines have been uh, trained uh, 
uh, in a real environment. And during those training system, you would like that on uh, safe action are not explored because that's exactly what uh, uh, reinforcement learning does. It goes to the environment, it uh, choose um, actions um, and uh, sometimes uh, explore unknown actions to learn from those actions uh, based on the reward function. It learns a policy of how to make decision. Um, so um, this um, left-hand side um, architecture is about the standard uh, reinforcement learning. Again, you have an agent and environment. Agents make an action in the environment, and then it receives some reward based on the objective that the agent has from the environment, and based on this reward function, learns what are the good and bad action in which state. Okay? But if you would like to prevent these uh, reinforcement learners of exploring unsafe action, then obviously you need to have a notion of what is unsafe actions. Right? So we assume here that for safety critical system, you are aware and you know what are the safety critical property that you would like to ensure. Which action should not be taken in which state, for example. Right? So I, I gave example of norms, which was exactly this kind of uh, properties. So in this new architecture, which we basically have the reinforcement learning, but we build a shield around this, um, or uh, in between agents and environment. Basically, the shield uh, is uh, guaranteeing or take the action of an agent which has decided to perform in a certain state, and the shield to decide whether this action is unsafe or not, right? And the shield decide whether this action should be explored or an alternative action should be taken, right? So this shield is basically, uh, in a theoretical computer science sense, is an automata, right? That basically says, okay, which, uh, in which state, which actions are allowed and in which state the actions are not allowed. So these shields basically take the actions and then uh, they guarantee that if the action is safe, it can uh, perform in the environment. Otherwise, it goes to the agents and asks for a new action in that state. Okay? And um, now, what is the problem with the standard shield uh, reinforcement learning is the computational complexity. Uh, it is double exponential in the size of the property, LTL, uh, the property that you would like to uh, guarantee. And uh, when you also run uh, such a reinforcement learning, it basically operates in a kind of a product automata because you have a shield as automata, you have an MDP, the environment uh, that a reinforcement learning tries to learn. And what you do is, uh, theoretically, you take the product of these two automata and that is basically means that the environment plus the supervisor plus the guider get a kind of very much larger space of uh, possibilities and the policy should operate in this uh, big policy. So what we propose in a recent work is uh, a much more practical solution, which is as expressive as LTL shields. LTL is uh, linear uh, temporal logic uh, shields, so the properties that you would like to secure are uh, temporal properties. And um, we use uh, pure past uh, temporal logic, uh, basically, to mask the actions, right? So this pure past um, uh, formulas basically indicate which action should not be taken at certain state. So these things that we uh, uh, would like to have is, um, how can I go back, oh yeah. Um, so the, the type of property that we would like to have is, for example, you have a cocktail party and then you have a service robot and the robot uh, should basically serve uh, drinks, alcoholic drinks to the, uh, to the participants. And, but you would like, for example, uh, not to serve alcohol to children and you would not like to, for example, serve twice, more than uh, two drinks uh, to each guest. Right? So I suppose this. And these are kind of non-Markovian properties, properties that really need the whole past history uh, to decide which actions are prohibited and which not. Right? So if there is a guest which asks for a, a third drink and you know that you have served for twice uh, to this guest, then uh, you should not offer any more uh, a drink. 
So this kind of property we can ensure by using this uh, pure past uh, temporal logic action masking approach, which is uh, substantially less expensive as uh, using the normal standard uh, shield in reinforcement learning. Okay, let me uh, finalize by focusing on the last uh, research line uh, that I uh, would like to, uh, uh, to share with you, and that's about uh, uh, traceability and responsibility of AI systems. Okay, so how can we find out if something bad has happened, for example, in a traffic situation involving many autonomous cars, who was responsible and maybe to which degree they were responsible. So this is issue is again has a kind of uh, background in a philosophy. For example, um, Harry um, Frankfurt in um, 1965 proposed this notion of responsibility, which says basically an individual is, is responsible for an outcome if uh, that individual um, could uh, uh, has caused basically the, the outcome, but could do otherwise. Right? It's a very general definition. It has been criticized for many, uh, uh, many gaps uh, that, uh, that is hidden in this definition. But recently, uh, two of my colleagues in the Netherlands, they came with a new definition of responsibility, which says an agent is uh, responsible if the agent is autonomous, intentional, and capable of uh, distinguishing right and bad. So these are philosophical studies. If there exists a causal relation right, between the action of agents and the outcome, uh, for which uh, we want to hold uh, the individual responsible. And the, ha the agent has a reasonable possibility in the past uh, to do otherwise. Right? So I can hold you responsible if you um, decided autonomously, if you caused the out bad outcome, if you really has contributed to, to the bad outcome, and you could do otherwise. Okay? These definitions are coming from philosophy, but also implemented in a legal reasoning in a court system when they want to uh, attribute uh, liability to individuals. But a prime example of this responsibility or challenges in a responsibility is uh, done by, for example, this uh, example. Some of you might know it. So there is um, this scenario. There is a traveler. It goes to make a trip through the desert. And, um, and it needs uh, some uh, water reserve. And uh, so he goes and before passing the desert, he sleeps. And uh, he had two enemies. So enemy one comes when the traveler was in sleep and he poisoned the water, right? And he moves away. And then after him, another enemy comes and he emptied the water because both of actions uh, would kill the traveler, right? And obviously, the next day, uh, the traveler, without checking the water reserve, go to the desert and dies. Right? And then the question is, who is responsible for his death? Right? The one who poisoned the water or the one who emptied the water? Right? And, um, and obviously, the option is also available that both agents are uh, responsible. So basically, this is a very important question. It requires kind of formal a precise definition, and definitely if you want to apply it to this kind of formal automata or formal uh, autonomous system. So we have a proposed uh, an, an, a definition of a responsibility, which has to do with also epistemics. So the, the way, for example, did um, the agents have enough information about uh, what's going to, be, uh, to, to happen? Uh, for example, the second um, agency here, could uh, the second agent know that the water was poisoned or not? Right? Or um, uh, so all this kind of uh, complicated matter. I come in, in uh, short to to explain some of those gaps in this responsibility uh, issue. So the question is, who causes basically the de the death of an uh, individual? And the causation is different than responsibility. And who is responsible for the debt? Right? So this causation and responsibility become two distinct uh, 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 concepts. So in this case, um, this uh, diagram, which is basically a transition system, again, saying okay, that in the starting state, uh, the first enemy could poison or not. And, uh, based on the outcome of those actions, the second enemy could decide whether to empty the water or not. And these are all possible movements. And um, if we apply 
our notion of responsibility, then we can uh, indicate that obviously the cause of the debt was emptying water, but both agents are responsible for the debt of this uh, individual traveler. Right? And this uh, notion of responsibility has to do with epistemics, with um, uh, knowing that they had the potential to avoid, uh, for example, the bad outcome, in this case, the debt of the traveler. Um, now, we are working on some challenges in this uh, respect, as I said. There are many gaps in this notion of responsibility, like, for example, you have a car scenario in this uh, system. There is a car, blue car, is an autonomous car, and then there is Alice uh, walking uh, over the um, uh, sidewalk. And, um, and uh, the blue car, the autonomous car, kills Alice, right? And the question is, is he responsible or not? Now, this depends on whether, for example, this building, uh, which is uh, basically prevent uh, the autonomous car of uh, sensing Alice, right, can be a reason to dismiss the responsibility, right, of the autonomous car. But what about if, uh, for example, the autonomous car was designed not to harm the passenger and the driver, right? So if he had, uh, for example, an alternative move, like, for example, to go straight ahead and, and, and hitting the rail of the, uh, the, the way and, and, and potentially uh, uh, injuring the driver or the passenger, right? Would, um, and, and the system, the autonomous car, is designed not to harm the passenger and the driver, would that dismiss the responsibility of killing Alice? And finally, what if uh, the blue car kill Alice while because of he follows the traffic and, and social norms, right? That, for example, he had to move. He couldn't stop when it was green. He had to move on, and that was the cause of, for example, accident. Right? So these are all kind of issues that um, basically make this notion of responsibility very challenging. Now, um, the message that I would like you to take away is that um, the development in AI requires for measures to control uh, the behavior of AI systems, especially when they are used in a safety critical systems. So we should think about mechanisms uh, that we can use to control the behavior of system, uh, especially for the black uh, box systems, where we don't know what they are potentially um, capable of which kind of actions they might do, might not do. So we have to take measures uh, and, and, and we cannot stop them. We shouldn't also not stop them because they really are doing great at, uh, progress in our society. But we should uh, find out how we can control their behavior. And my message is that uh, 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 symbolic systems uh, where we can express basically our desire requirements uh, explicitly and symbolically can be used and combined to empower this uh, very efficient and uh, effective machine learning techniques. So there is fortunately uh, a lot of uh, work these days to combine these symbolic and sub-symbolic approaches, especially when uh, the applications are concerning these uh, safety critical uh, systems. Um, so um, yeah, I would... Um, like to end my talk here and uh, like to answer your question. Thank you very much. Merida Stani!